Hello everyone, I'm Vivek Roy from India and I'm representing Air Dialogue for today's discussion on oversight of racism in Ireland. Before getting into detail, please do not forget to like, share and subscribe our YouTube channel and follow us on social media for more events such as these. Well, Air Dialogue is established in Dublin in 2010 and is a sister organization for Dialogue Society with the aim of advancing social caution by connecting communities, empowering people to engage and contributing to the development of ideas on dialogue and community building. It does this by bringing people together through discussion forums like these, courses, capacity building publications and outreach. It operates nationwide with regional branches across the island. Now coming to racism, as defined by Oxford Dictionary, racism is prejudice, discrimination or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. I personally remember Michelle Obama press note where she said, like so many of you, I am pained by this recent tragedies and I'm exhausted by a heartbreak that never seems to shop. Race and racism is a reality that so many of us grow up learning to just deal with it. But if we ever hope to move past it, it can't just be on people of color to deal with it. It is up to all of us, black, white, everyone, no matter how well meaning we think we might be to do the honest, uncomfortable work of rooting out. It starts with self-examination and listening to those whose lives are different from our own. It ends with justice, compassion and empathy that manifest in our lives and on our streets. I pray that we all have strength for, for that journey. Did you know that Iris Net work against racism found an online incident reporting system to which victims can report anonymously. A recent study by them in 2019 stated that there were almost 50 racial assaults, which was their highest number reported since they started. Ladies and gentlemen, this panel today will raise awareness of racism in Ireland. Our speakers coming from diverse backgrounds will bring better understanding of racism experienced by the Irish society at large and its effects. Without further ado, I am leaving the floor to the speaker. Each, now each speaker would speak for 10 minutes and then we will be open for questions from the audience. Firstly, I would like to welcome Elika Ziaombe. She has completed her bachelor's degree in applied sciences. She has also co-founded Our Table Dublin and is passionate about food and also has won multiple Irish food awards. In 2019, Kizyombe ran as a candidate in the local elections with the Social Democrats in Dublin's North Inner City constituency. She was the first person living in direct provision to run in local elections. Eli Kizyombe is a Malawian activist and a, forum, and a former asylum seeker living in Ireland. Recently, she spoke at Let's Talk, Let's Talk About It dialogue series organized by African Professional Network of Ireland. I take great pleasure in inviting you to this discussion, Ali. Welcome aboard. Ali, I think you're in I mute. always, yeah, I always forget to mute myself. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, um, for inviting me, Roy and Afra. It's been an honor to be here. So as you've actually said it much introduction, of myself, so I moved to Ireland almost a decade ago, almost a decade ago, and um, find myself to navigate um, to seek uh, asylum, and that's the reason that I actually moved over from Malawi. It's because I wanted to actually move somewhere where I can uh, seek sanctuary. Um, what actually made it easier for me in Ireland was the people that they were organizing my journey for me to fly to wherever I could go. Ireland was one of the um, easy place to get to because a Malawian passport did not have a visa. And, you know, like it was very, very easy for them to actually get me uh, out there. So I, I arrived in Ireland and navigated my way and then, you know, like seek asylum. Uh, as I don't, I don't know, like we're all from diaspora, but I came here to seek asylum. And just to speak on how to get yourself into the system, it's not a very simple um, way. It's very complicated because you have to go into a system whereby there is full of judgment 
of, you know, like, because there is also a certain uh, criteria of whereby asylum seeker it's been looked into. So all of these are designed to make people feel that they are even uh, running away from the right reasons to move into seek asylum. And, uh, you know, like, but I managed and I went into direct provision. And while I was in direct provision, it's when I realized that, you know what, this is not what I was expecting. Unfortunately, at that time I was battling depression and I also had my kids, I've left home family and I've lost parents and I've lost some of high family member because I'm also coming from a big political background. And, you know, like, and there was so much also going on that I actually left when I was coming here. So I was in the middle of the crisis. So, you know, like coming over here and find myself in the situation whereby, you know, it was not even very easy for me to pick myself up and find also the system that it's really, you know, like undermining and portray people in a way that, you know, that's not I would expect from a democratic country like Ireland, which Ireland has said itself quite a lot, like in Zambia, in Malawi, I didn't know that that's how big Irish people are in Zambia or Malawi. And these are also people that they've set up a foundation and they've come and preach about, you know, like human rights and all of that stuff. You know, it kind of like, it agreed me to see like, what's going on here? But anyway, uh, then through my time living in there, I was really lucky to be approached by Irish Refugee Council. And I took an, uh, a volunteer employment in Irish Refugee Council and also coming from a background whereby I understand about basic human rights and, you know, like in that people shouldn't be living like the way people were living in the system. So I started campaigning and speaking out of, you know, like the direct provision system. At that time, there were no much of direct provision system because the system was designed to actually fail and not only fail, but it was designed to portray asylum seekers as people, as sponges, as people that just come over here to Europe and, uh, and uh, take, you know, like welfare and things like that. So it was not a very easy situation for actually me to, to do that. And luckily enough, I was really lucky that I was able to be part of to educate the Irish community, although it was really hard at that time. And you know, like even in 2013, 20, 2010, 2011, 2013, as that the system has been here for 20 years, there was not much talk about direct provision. Even up to 2017, there was not much talk about direct provision. And you know, like I took the issue as my own and start battling out and speaking and raising voice, raising campaigns and creating so much campaign. I appreciate the opportunity that the Irish Refugee Council gave me because I think they gave me a platform that I could do a lot and I could link up with many people, which it really worked. And also like for me, I just made it as of my own and use that to um, think, to, to uh, use that for the campaign. People started listening, it was not easy. Then I introduced a different campaign to go into universities and, you know, and to talk about direct provision. Uh, it was not very easy because, you know, like uh, the issue about asylum and refugees and, you know, like direct provision, it's very, very complex, right? In a very complex, in a way that it also divided the community. People feels like, okay, these are people that are just coming here to actually take what it is ours. And not even only that, people also look at the people that are in there as like they are just baggages and people that people want to show them away, their charity. So there is a mix of uh, like emotional there. And, and, and the way the government designed it, there wasn't apathy to the community. And that was some of the thing. But anyway, we succeeded. We supported by community. Community started listening and started uh, supporting uh, campaigns and the campaigns grew. And then, you know, like uh, in 2015, I met a friend of mine, Michelle Damode, through my ex boss then. And then we sat down. It's when we set up the, our table. So our table was set up to integrate people from refugee background and my and asylum seeker and also migrant, migrant to give them a platform where they could come, integrate, and also training and gain employment because people were staying for a very, very long time in direct provision. And with all of that, uh, our table really 
graced us with a very good uh, uh, response from the public. You know, like we got an enormous uh, um, publications, media coverage, and we were supported by doctors, lawyers, and many other people. And I think that was like the very, very first time that I saw how the asylum issues could be talked in Ireland to that level, right? That that space was created. I never knew like there were many, many organizations that could support asylum seeker, but that opened us our eyes to see groups, you know, like even some groups formed during our time, our group. So it was really a success and our table has gone on till right now. And in 2019, I decided to run for the office for a uh, uh, council office. And, you know, like I also get a lot of support, although my campaign was, you know, like, which I don't like to talk about that because of legalities, but, uh, you know, like there was so much that was going on around there, but, you know, like I'm a woman of color and also an asylum seeker and an asylum seeker that has established well herself in Ireland, which I've supported by Irish people and Irish people did not just support me here. I'm really lucky that Shane is here tonight. You know, like these are the people that stood their grounds for me. And I had like the endorsement of Irish celebrities, you know, like I had super lawyers like coming, what do you want us to do for you? I had so much like really going on and that even me myself, like up to now, I don't, I don't really, I still get advice till now. I still get people that are strong with support. And I still also get people that feel like that situation played in a very different way. But you know, like sometimes I choose not to beat down by people, by few people who are just so intimidated by people that, by women like me, that we are so strong and we stand for what we believe. And then they can intimidate me to run out of my, my principles or my ideas. I don't want to fall into that pit. And I, I know racism is there and I know it happened to me because I was a black woman, an asylum seeker, but you know what? I don't wanna look it in that way. I wanna look it, I don't, I'm not a victim of that situation because I am very strong and powerful and that's what that happened to me. My focus is for the future to actually, you know, like represent my people and the people that come from, you know, like uh, uh, all over the world to come to Ireland to make them home. Irish people are very nice. I'm very, very surrounded by very, very good people that they've never walked away and they fought my battle and they could die for me. And that give me the uh, a grace and opportunity to say that we shouldn't get with one or two bad apple. You know, like Ireland is a better place for you, for me, and for everyone who wants to come here to live here. Lessism is gonna be there, but it's just for this small, and illiterate, you know, like ignorant people that they don't even have direction. They don't even know what to do. There is a lot of platform that we shouldn't be fighting for, you know, like we can all live there and share what we have. And, you know, like I'm, I'm happy I got my residency. I'm now living in a community. I live in one of the best community. My neighbors are so good. You know, like, although uh, the pandemic has come, but this year has been one of the years that I've been very, very busy and they've been so, you know, like great projects that's coming out and I'm just looking forward to physically exit 2020 with a good physical healthy because, oh man, 2021 is proving to be so exciting. So I'm just so happy and looking forward to that. <laughs> and that's about Ellie. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you, so you much. Thank you very much, Ellie. That, that was uh, so inspired, you know, so insightful and so inspiring, you know, uh, the way you fought with the struggles, the way you fought in the middle of crisis and the way you, you know, lost your family, but then you still chose to fight rather than, you know, sitting quiet because there are so many women, there are so many people around the globe who chose to sit quiet and did not speak out, but you chose to speak out and you chose to fight for your rights and that is very inspiring. Thank you very much. And I, I really like the you know, we said that Ireland is for everyone. It's just not Irish or it's just not American. It's yeah. it's for everyone. So mm -hmm. I, I really like the way you said that. And thank you so much for that. So thank now, you. yeah, thank you very much. Now let's have Lorraine Connor. Uh, now I would like to welcome Lorraine Connor. Yeah. Lorraine Connor is uh, a chairman of Muslim Sisters of Air and she is also working. Uh, I'm so sorry. 
uh, yeah. Lorraine O'Connor is uh, chairman of Muslim Sister of Air. Air. She's also working as a uh, volunteer for that. And uh, the Muslim Sisters of Air is an organization which is working for women, Muslim women living in Ireland and also for the development and integration of air. Now she's also a volunteer and she's also a mother of four girls. Now I would like to welcome Lorraine on this virtual stage to give her insights about racism in Ireland. I welcome you, Lorraine. Lorraine, I guess you're in mute. Uh, Lorraine, I guess you're in mute. I did exactly what Ellie did. <laughs> Eliza, thank you very much. Um, Ellie, that was a beautiful, 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 inspiring talk. And go you. And keep going. That's the way forward. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. Um, I think um, dialogue like this is the way forward. It's extremely important for um, people to come together, have these kinds of talk and help people understand. I always say the way forward is dialogue and it's about understanding each other's paths and um, visions that we are in. So you may say to yourself, okay, why is there an Irish woman here tonight? And, um, you know, on this and, and, you know, what she got, you know, how, how can she be a victim of racism? How can she understand Islamophobia? How can she understand the struggle of women and families in direct provision and so forth and so on? In 2005, I became a Muslim. And unfortunately, um, that's when I stopped being Lorraine from the north side of Dublin and I became an immigrant within my own country. I was dumbfounded, I was shocked, I was horrified of what I was seeing. There were pockets of Islamophobia and racial um, attacks on myself and my family. And I was, this, this just, it didn't make sense. You know, how can I be a foreigner within my own country? How can I be the victim of racial um, incidents? And how can my children be the victim of racial incidents? There is no foreign blood in my family. Um, there is actually a very patriotic, my mother, my father, my great grandfather and um, fought in the 1916 rise and so forth and so on. I'm like, whoa, so this is Ireland. This is what's happening. So I then start wearing the shoes of an immigrant within Irish society and I start seeing it. I start looking in the mirror and I said, well, you know what, if I am having this, what is my migrant brothers and sisters what is happening to them when they come into this country? What is their struggles? If I'm feeling this struggle as an Irish woman, what are they feeling? So this is when I decided between 2005 and 2010 to educate myself. And when I say educate myself, what I mean is I went back to college. I studied women's studies for and uh, graduated in UCD then I got involved in the outer community I got involved in uh, communities NGOs um, and um, state funded organizations to do with racism to do with women the rape crisis center women's aid I became a volunteer in the domestic violence services then I went on um, within my local area to find a state funded organization solely for women I volunteered in that and I was with them for about four years and then went on to become chairperson of that organization. And when I started in that organization, um, there were no um, migrant women. There were no one. And there was Lorraine from Kulak with a hijab on her head saying, no, 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 we have to have migrant women in this. So we formed an ethnic minority group. And then I start calling different women in from the mosque and so forth and so on. Because within the mosque, you have lots of different ethnicities. You have women, Muslim women who are Nigerian, Pakistani, India, Bangladesh, all different race and ethnicity. So you have a huge culture there as well, you know, culture diversity. So um, that went on for five years. And then in the uh, fifth year, I felt ready. OK, it's time to do something. So this is when we say the birth of Muslim Sisters of Era was formed. So I got a couple of the women together and said, you know what, we need to do something. 
unfortunately, Muslim women are the most seen to be oppressed women in the whole of society. You know, they, they come from a background where they say they're in the most male dominant religion. They're oppressed, they're suppressed, they're the rest, everything. And I said, you know, we have to break down this typical stereotype. And, and I think the way forward was by educating the Irish society. And how could we educate Irish society? was how could we promote dialogue? How could we promote social inclusion? How could we promote diversity? And how could we get a way forward for the society to understand the real Muslim woman, you know, but not what society perceives us to be. So um, we started doing lots of different activities, started off very small doing different activities and found that you listen to what the women wanted. You know, we'd ask, what do you want? What are your vision? What would you like to see? It started off in the beginning with like knitting mornings, baking mornings, um, time out for me mornings, um, just a coffee morning. And then uh, after about two years of establishing that and getting the trust first of the women and getting them to come out of their different um ethnicities uh, as, as uh, Eddie said there was a compressed vision within our community because you have all different ethnicities staying with their own kind of cocoon you know you would have Nigerian sisters staying all with the Nigerian sisters the Arab sisters staying with the Arab sisters Pakistani sisters all staying all together you know in their pockets of speaking their own language cooking their own food but yet they're part of the Muslim community so it was picking each one out of each group and forming a bigger group and collectively having a speaker of each group to go back in to these women and see what their needs were. So after a couple of years then, we started having conferences and I felt then it was time to start bringing, you know, these Muslim women together with non-Muslims and how can we collaborate and work together? How can we work on combating the very stereotype and that is making a barrier be, and it's a creating an us and a them. It should, there should be never an us and them. We are all one, we're all human beings and we all have different parts in life, but we all are the same. There should be no higher or lower, no skin color is better than my skin color, no ethnicity, no religion. We are just one. We're all human beings on this beautiful earth. So um, that's when we started doing all the conferences. And we've been doing them every year and we've been doing faith dialogues and interfaith diftars and so forth and so on. And then about six years ago, we started with uh, one of our biggest projects to date, and that's the Homeless Project. And we run that outside the GPO every Friday night, and we have six, uh, sorry, five six-foot tables. And the food and the culinary there every Friday night is, is amazing, and, and the sheer commitment from the women is amazing as well. But when we went there, this idea I got in the very beginning about six years ago, we went with one six-foot table one flask, one, one pot of kind of like a stew soup. And it was a very hostile situation to bring Muslim women outside the GPO down with people who have addictions. And their addictions can be with drink, it can be with drugs, it can be with anything. And I, I you know, to have that kind of, of, of addiction, I couldn't understand, do you know what I mean? Sorry, I could, I could relate to. Because they're very thing that the people down there at the GPO are being stereotyped about. Oh, I'm so sorry, there's someone at my door. Could you just so so sorry? So sorry, one second. Uh, I'm so sorry, guys. She has a baby to look after, so that's why she just, you know, to, she has to do the alliance and all to just, you know, give a quick two minutes. So sorry about that. I do sincerely apologize. One of my daughters, I'll leave it at that. But um, yeah, so I could relate to the stereotype that these poor people were being stereotyped, styped, sorry, stereotyped. And I said, you know, this has to stop. We have to be able to recognize people and recognize them as, as a human being. So I told the women, you know, we need to keep doing this. You know, don't forget them. I, I felt like the homeless were the forgotten people. That's the way I would say, you know, these are the forgotten people and we are here to help them. And one of the five pillars of Islam, the very foundation of Islam is charity. 
So anyway, make a long story short, we stayed there and it was very hostile. It was really, really difficult in the beginning. But I mean, once you keep going and once you help the homeless and, and understand that we're here to help you, we're not here against you. We're not here to try and convert you. One of the rules down there at the GPO is you're not allowed to speak about religion at all. You're there for a purpose of giving. And that's where it ends. No more than that. Give, care, look after. And six years later, you know, we're, we're very proud to say that we've won the trust of these people. And sometimes people would say to me, why, why would you help him? He's only a junkie. He's only an alcoholic. Why would you even waste your time with them? And I'd say that's a person. That is a person that belonged in their mother's arms sometime in their life. And joy and love came to the mother when she gave birth to that child. And who am I to stereotype that very person because of the path they choose? Because this is what we're fighting as well, acceptance. So, I mean, we, we, we have done so much in the past 10 years, just before the pandemic, the lockdown in March, we celebrated 10 years and what we achieved in 10 years. And, and the past couple of years have been amazing. We have... Um, two years running now we have been in three different secondary school books we're in the junior cert and we're in the leave cert we're also um, nationwide it's a very very famous rt program and um, came and um to us last year and before the pandemic and you know stayed with us and filmed us and so forth and so on and rte learn took the rights of that so it goes into all the schools and colleges which it, you know to do with muslim women in irish society and also part of the teachings on, on islam and diversity and so forth and so on to achieve that is amazing and just um yesterday we found out which was a great milestone for us that we won the Ireland Volunteer Awards in the large category so that's all being announced tomorrow so these women have been amazing and they've been on a 10-year journey and the journey hasn't been easy believe you me it hasn't it wasn't easy for me in the beginning either I'm still fighting for the very existence that my forefathers fought for even though this is my country because this, see this, this changes your identity in a second. If you put a thousand Muslim women in, in, a, in a big room, all Muslim, and you put one wearing this scarf on her head, they'd say, there's the Muslim woman. And they say the other 999, they don't know what religion they are. So this has been a constant battle for me. And it's, it's a battle that, you know, I'm proud of. I'm not going to let society strip me has who I am. I changed my fate. I didn't change who I am. Society did. And I can relate to what Ellie was saying there. We've worked so much in direct provision centers so many times. And uh, the first time I went to direct provision in Mosley was about seven years ago, because as a child, I had so many memories in there. That was a huge holiday camp. I spent my time as a child in there on holidays. And to see it as a direct provision center, can be very heart-wrenching because these people are coming here and again they're stereotyped the refugees to come to bleed this system so far and so on so many times i've been classed as a refugee someone had come up to me oh look at you refugees you're all the same and when i open this mouth and they hear this accent then they realize i ain't no refugee and i go how dare you speak or stereotype anyone like that and and you do see the division in these uh, direct provision centers. We're in them constantly. We're constantly helping women and helping people in these centers. And I don't think the government is doing enough for them either. But that's another project that we'll be working on. So, yeah. So I hope that um, helped you other than my door is knocking on the door. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Lorraine, for that. That was so inspiring because uh, I personally come from a background where, you know, uh, from a state where uh, women are not given priority and many of the Muslim women are, you know, they get married uh, underage and they're, yeah. they're not given the right to choose anything. And most of my friends actually were Muslims, you know, who studied college with me. They're not allowed to go movies. They're not to do anything. They're, they're not even allowed to, you know, just come into the hall, living hall when there are guests. So there are, they have been suppressed everywhere in the society, in the college, in the, in the education, in the own family as well. And I really uh, get inspired the way you're, you know, you're trying to bring forces to fight against 
uh, the this suppressing of society and you know trying to bring a change and how we can actually promote dialogue in society for the culture and for people as well. Yeah, yeah you see, this is where you have culture, mm -hmm. Indian culture, mm -hmm. Arab culture, Pakistan, and Islam. They're completely yeah. different. True. So this is what's perceived, and this is what we're trying to divide. Yeah. And yes, yes, I, I completely agree with you for that. And, and also, thank you very much for the homeless project you're doing every Friday night. Because uh, whenever I go to city center, I see a lot of people who are homeless, who are without food. And I hopefully, you know, that everyone is actually, you know, eating food because of your project. And thank you very much for that. So now that stage is, if you guys want to discuss anything or if Ali or Lorraine, if you guys want to ask questions to each other, this the stage is yours. If you guys anything to discuss among each other, you know, I know because Ali come from a different background and Lorraine, you come from a very different background. So what do you think that, you know, you guys can share with each other? But I think both myself and Ellie have very much a lot in common. <laughs> That's acceptance, very much. There's two women. One is a, an Irish woman who was fighting for her rights not to be perceived as an immigrant, to remember that I'm still an Irish woman. And then you have an immigrant woman coming in and fighting for her rights mm -hmm. to be accepted as well as Irish. And rightly so, she is Irish. So I think we do have something very much in common, Ellie. Yeah, 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 we do. And also as women like this, like you guys, how long you said you've run this project? We're 10 years now. Oh, 20, 10 years now. Yeah. And uh, how do you get your, like you do food and all of that stuff and where does this food come from and how do you cook? Do you, are you, do you get funding and stuff like that? Okay, so the, the, the way the whole the soup run now works is we have one, two, three different WhatsApp groups. We've about mm -hmm. 60 volunteers. Mm -hmm. We've got a main head on each volunteer group. Mm -hmm. We've got women from all over Dublin and outer Dublin, down as far as Balbriggan and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. We're a registered charity with a CHY number. So we're, we're, everything we have is transparent and, and it's with the charity regulator. Mm -hmm. We are also registered to an, a fa an app called Food Cloud. Mm -hmm. And Food Cloud are interlinked with all the big supermarkets, which would be mm -hmm. Tesco, Lidl, Dons, mm -hmm. and Aldi, the four main supermarkets. Mm -hmm. So there's surplus food each night. You would get on your app so many trays of ambient food and so forth and so on available mm -hmm. in Renala or Crumlin. And you would deny or accept Mm -hmm. and we would accept so okay, you'll probably hear my phone going in a minute because we collect on Thursday nights and Friday mm -hmm. so all that ambience food now mm -hmm. talking about ambience food would be all collected from many different cars and many different um, volunteers and then the cooked food we have a certain amount of volunteers who are assigned to cook because each one of these volunteers have done the HACCP training Mm -hmm. So you have to have that. We have the certificates of that. And then they would cook the food. Now, usually what we would do is before uh, the virus, we would bring this food in in big cooler boxes. And them cooler boxes work to keep food cold and to keep food hot. And you would have a thermometer and you put it in before seven. It has to be over seven. I'm a chef, so I do understand all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I don't, yeah, there you go. I don't need to explain that to you. Yeah. So then the food is given out, okay? So a lot of the support that we get is um, restaurants donate food to us. Women cook from their own hearts. Or if they can't cook, they'll buy the food. And then the people who are trained will cook this food. Mm -hmm. We get huge donations. Mm -hmm. We're not state. We, we do get some funding. Most of our funding is for integration. But our mm -hmm. biggest funder to date mm -hmm. is the Irish public. We're verified on Facebook. Mm -hmm. We're with PayPal account. And the Irish public, we've climbed that hill for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it's been a long, long road. Mm -hmm. But we're just about here. And um, the Irish public right now in the past year are amazing mm -hmm. 17,000 uh, followers on Facebook mm -hmm. we started Twitter about four months ago and there's 5,000 followers on Twitter mm -hmm. and this is the Irish public mm -hmm. they're just amazing and, and they've funded us so much not only with, with, with acceptance but also mm -hmm. financially mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah 
we we we're, we are very blessed, Ellie. You know, mm-hmm. and and we really are to be where we are today. Mm-hmm. And and I, you know, I always say, the man above has given us blessings because there's been patience there. Yeah. <laughs> don't have any blessings without. Yeah. The man above, I always say, yeah. mm-hmm. but the people, you know, I, it has me grown up in in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Ireland's very. I'm Irish, and Ireland is my heart. Is who I am. Mm. And I know this this road, I knew eventually this road will come to a road of acceptance Mm -hmm. because Irish people were cocooned. And when immigrants come into the country, a different religion, so different Mm -hmm. ways of living, the Irish people are very set in their ways. Mm -hmm. And it does, the change doesn't happen overnight, especially in Ireland. Mm -hmm. But I think that not only with Muslim women and not only with my organization, but the likes of yourself, change is happening now. Mm-hmm. It is happening. The client is turning. It's turning slow, but it's turning. Mm-hmm. And acceptance, just listen to you talking about beautiful Mayo, where mm-hmm. I spent a lot of my childhood and the love that you get down there. Yeah, it's it's overwhelming. Yeah. 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 That, that's nice. No, great I, to know. <laughs> I guess we have some questions here on the chat. So this question is for Lorraine. So it's from Britt Boyok. And it says, with your great work being featured widely and featuring in school textbooks to reach youth, why do you think the racist attacks are still happening? Sorry, I didn't get that. I think it's the echo again. I'm very sorry. Okay. Uh, So a, a question here for you, Lorraine. It says, with your great work being featured widely and featuring in school textbooks, to reach the youth, why do you think racist attacks are still happening in Ireland? Well, I think, look, you know what? There again, we go back to change. Change is happening, but it's happening very slowly. Um, I think no matter where you go in the world, it's not only Ireland. Racism is everywhere because there's this hierarchy level. Some human beings, and especially white supremacists, think we're here, you're there. And it's people's mindset of thinking. And I think the media has an awful lot to play in it as well. I think the media has a huge um, lot to play in in division and programming people to think, you know, um, you're here, white people are here, um, people of different skin texture are here. Um, Catholic religion is the only religion in the whole of the world. Different religions. I'm not going to talk about Muslim. I'm going to talk about all different religions are here. No religion, you know. So I think no matter where you are in the world, you are going to see racial racial incidents. Um, How we move forward to try and keep working on that is dialogue. And, and again, that's the way forward and understanding. We do a lot. We do a program um, in the schools and it's called This Is Me. And we go into secondary schools and we help. We show the work that we've been doing. We talk about dialogue. We talk about understanding. We talk about ethnicity, diversity, uh, race, color, creed, gender. We talk about all of that. And we give the students a platform to, to speak to us and, and, you know, again, they're through dialogue. It's the way forward and they come out with a different understanding. So, yeah, nice. hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes, yes, it definitely does. And there we have another question from Prashant Singh uh, to Ellie. Uh, so, Ellie, is there any law that can be introduced to reduce racism or is there any law already that is in place that potential race assaults can be used? No, I know that, uh, you know, like I wish if Shane was here because he could have been the right person to actually do that because Shane has pushed quite a lot on that. I know like we have worked so much and the anti-racism island and groups like us to push about hate crime. But I think uh, I don't want to go with numbers because this was like accurate to do with Shane. I've not had research on that. I know that a lot of people, like people like me, like I have encountered a lot of racism, uh, racist uh, incidents, right? But sometimes you kind of like get tired and you choose not to be a victim and you don't want to report that. So, you know, like people like me, if I've been through so much hurt, you know, like uh, when my whole saga started, it was one lady who is very popular with racist acts in Ireland kind of like tweeted something on Twitter, right? And I was called to be advised to say, she's actually tweeted something about you on Twitter, but the way she's actually um, drafted 
you can't sue her, but maybe you should just make a, um, you should just report to IE report. And then I sit down and like, okay, should I do, you know, sometimes you feel like, uh, cause people are getting away with so many crazy things. And as you can see, there is so many racist acts happening, mainly to black people and also people of color, you no know, migrant. And when it comes to black people and Muslims, I think we get everything that's on the plate. <laughs> Definitely. Right? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, like we get tired because this becomes our lives. Right. So like, like I remember there was a day I walk into city center. I tell you, this is honest, pure truth. I had to be not only insulted, but to be treated unfairly in the institution that it's a government institution by two different institutions. So, you know, like, how can you report both of those incidents? Like you are a human being, you know, this plays up with your mind. You are coming from social welfare and this happens to you and you run and go report. And you are coming from the, uh, you're you, you coming from the interior uh, in, in, in city center, something happens to you and you have to run and, 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 and report it. Talk alone in the things that you interact, like it, it, it happens to you on every day on the streets. So people will become more tired and we become resilient. And, and when we become resilient, we become so, you know, like uh, opinion, opinionated and some they feel, they feel like they're vulnerable. And, you know, like when you become strong like me, that you still continue and stand up, but you don't complain they start portraying you in a very different way. Oh, she's very difficult. She's a liar. She's this. They will find a way because, you know, like uh, the problem with the racism, it's, it's institutional racism because racism, it's on top there because the systems are built on racist structures, on people like us, right? And it's on top there. So the people that few who are ignorant that are under here, they have power to... To, to the top. So it's very, very hard to actually dismantle that racist from that ignorant people because you even find people in institutions that are working with people, with vulnerable people that are even more racist, right? And who works in these institutions? They are people and even well-educated academics. So, you know, you can actually see that if we want to dismantle racism, it has to start from the top and then it will be easier. Because if the law cannot protect one racist on the street and give them a harder enough sentence, you know, there won't be two, three tomorrow because they'll be scared. But if the law is protecting them, yeah, they can do whatever they want. So you don't wanna give them power. You don't wanna make them like feel like they have something to do. That's why we just keep going. So that's why it's very hard to see racism decreasing. You know, it's because of this uh, institution um, racist structures. Do you agree with that? Thank you for the answer. And there is another question question for Lorraine. Uh, this is from, from Traveler Belmont. And he asks, is there a specific approach for getting young people into dialogue society? It, is, it must be my speaker. Is there a, sorry, say that again? Is there a specific approach for getting young people into dialogue society? I think the approach always, I mean, for us with young people, and I can only speak for uh, at the moment, the Muslim community and then with the non-Muslim community, youth, I'll, I'll go to that in the beginning, uh, sorry, in a few minutes. So with, non uh, with Mus the Muslim community, we felt that a lot of the young girls were afraid to take a stand, afraid to speak out. So we started, um, oh, about five years ago, doing camps for them for the young girls and they would come and we would talk about one of the camps was finding the strength within we would connect and listen to their kind of complaints and their struggles and so forth and so on and we collectively get all their their um, talks and put them together and then work on a plan how they could go forward now thank god um some of these girls it's now three or four years later are studying um international politics uh, um, journalism, media, 
And I'm starting to see some of the Muslim girls now. And I always say, connect them to like a flower. In the beginning, they were just a small little rosebud and they're starting to bloom. And they're starting now to take a stand. We've got two of them working in the doll at the moment. And they're starting to be proactive. And I think that is getting, and this sounds a little bit harsh. So, you know, I've got to mind my words here, but getting them while they're young and helping them understand different faiths and helping them be proud of who they are. That is the way forward. Always nurture them. Be proud of no matter what path you take in life. If this path is for you, don't let anybody drag you down. Don't let anybody run you down. With non-Muslim um, youth, our way forward is the schools. We go again, we go into the schools. We ask them to be proactive. We ask them about understanding dialogue. And one of the key factors for us right now is being in the school curriculum. So we're in the curriculum for the junior cert and leave and cert books. So now when the youth have projects, they're ringing the office of Muslim Sisters of Era and say, look, can we do a project on Muslim Sisters of Era? Can we ask you so many questions? So now the need for us to go into classrooms is lessening because the books are there. We're in the curriculum. We have last week, we had three youth who are in their final year in uh, Griffith College in media and television. And they've been following us for a couple of weeks. I brought them down. They're doing their documentary and then they'll submit it for their final year. Then I have another young lady starting next week from DCU in her third year of media. And she's coming and following us. So, you know, again, dialogue. Um, if you can get into the curriculum, it's, it's a way forward. It's definitely a way forward. And by us getting into the curriculum, come here, it was a complete just came from nowhere well obviously it came from the blessing of god they say everything's from you know the blessing of god but i was down at the gpo one friday night up to my eyes now if you've ever passed down at the gpo it's crazy on a friday night and uh, this this young woman came up to me and she said she introduced herself and she said look uh, lorraine could i talk could i talk to someone in charge i said well look i'm the chairperson and she said da, 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 da. and she was da, 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 da. And my eyes were looking everywhere because you literally i don't serve i stand out because i am blessed to have grown up in dublin and i can see when something's going to kick off so you're kind of looking and i couldn't talk to her i said look i i hear what you're saying she was saying something about the department of education so forth and so on i said look there's my card I said, just give me a call during the week. I said, it's impossible to try and even discuss anything down here with you. That was it. I literally didn't pay much heed to it. Never dawned to me. And then about two days later, I got a phone call from her. And she was an author of the new book, Inspire One, which was coming out into the junior cert. And she said, I have been following you on Facebook and she said, this is the way forward. I really, really, really want Muslim Sisters of Era to be part of this book. And I was like, well, wow. You know, I was like, this is amazing. She said, this is the dialogue that young people need to be able to have at their hands and have in school. And um, we went on and, and did that book. And then the following year in 2019, then, she did inspire two. And in the first year, it was just a small passage and a picture of Muslim Sisters of Era and the reference on RT Learn of Nationwide. And then the second year, she done three pages of the Junior and Leave and Cert book. So this is how um, you, you, the way forward with young people, Muslim and non-Muslim. Uh -huh. Do you know what I mean? And this is how you can create dialogue mm -hmm. is by helping them to find their own strength within, to find their good within and support them and work on it with them. Sure. Nice. That's, that's really an interesting thing to look at. Uh, and this question from Lakshmi Raju, I guess it's for both Ellie and Lorraine. Uh, how can you people who are entering Ireland or how can people who are new to Ireland, you know, uh, uh, learn about racism in Ireland or are there any potential ideas or are there any potential uh, things you want to tell them or guide them with? Um, let me start with that. Mm -hmm. 
you know, like uh, it's not easy to come to a new country, but you know, like there is groups like Anti-Racism Island, which is inner, and they can actually Google that and see what's going on. And also, you know, like just Google out like um, gra uh, grassroots groups, you know, and that also it's a starting, uh, starting uh, procedure. Some mm -hmm. groups might work for you. Some groups might, um, uh, some some groups might work for you. Some groups might not work for you. But mm -hmm. you will always meet one or two people that can be appealing to you. And that's what I've actually, that's how I've done my work. I've actually done my work expecting so much from people or from the group or from the organization. But I've I've done my work expecting that out of any situation that I can find myself, I'll always find one genuine person that will take me to a next level because that that's what a journey is. You know, like because also one thing that we have to actually put in mind is like um when they become so much of you know like groups NGOs there is an ego there so when it comes to ego it sometimes it also uh exploit the people the service users right so people just kind of like turn away with their situation that they experience in the groups that they get involved like oh you know I don't want to go there because this is what I encountered but I always tell people like don't be disappointed don't even feel it out because if you search in that group there'll be one genuine person that will take you to the next level and that's why some of us we've actually grow to be where we are so you know like if people come come here do find grassroots groups find organizations like ina you will always find two to one people that is going to take you to the next next step and they're going to make you stay a little bit easier i will be leaving in five minutes because i'm on another uh uh, um, yeah, at 7.30. So yeah. I should just go and prepare for that. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. Um, I think, uh, so basically grassroots levels is the way forward. If you find a group that you feel comfortable in, um, egotistic people are all over the place, you know, and, and, you know, there are so many different groups out there. And unless you have a group that are consistent, and are consistent in their work and consistent in their compassion and what they are doing that it speaks volumes for itself you you, you won't need to sell it so um I mean, life is life is a lesson for everybody. It's a lesson for us all. And we will meet many lovely people along our path in life. And we will meet many people that we won't get on with. That's human nature. But it's how we move forward is, is I always say, is the reason. And I think when people are coming into Ireland, um, there are many different organisations out there. There's the Immigrant Council. There is an R. I've worked with Shane on many projects years ago. Um, a lovely man does an awful lot of work for an awful lot of uh, racial incidents and they have an, the eye report and so forth and so on. Um, the hate crime, we, we, we have a petition running at the moment. There's 5,000 signatures on it and we'll amalgamate that with an hour eventually. Um, and I think no one should be, you know, accept this. No one should accept being racially attacked. No one should accept being verbally racially attacked because what happens is people then feel the norm. And unless you keep reporting this and unless you keep pushing for it, our government won't change. So, yes, if you're only called a terrorist or, uh, you know, go back to where you came from, that still is a slur. It's a racial slur. And no one should encounter that. So yes, you should report it. Yes, you should act on it. Nobody is here to be run down. And again, the Irish government is very slow. It always has been. It's slow to change. But with constant um, groups like an R, like the Immigrant Council, like against uh, the Anti-Racism Network and so forth and so on, like ourselves, like Ellie, groups that are there and pushing it and saying, no, we're not going to accept this anymore and keep pushing these and do not go away, never go away. That's how change will eventually be encountered. Yes, definitely, that, that, is, that is very solid. So I just wanted to wrap this session by you know, a, a last quick thing. So what do you guys suggest about racial equality? How can we attain racial equality everywhere? Uh, and do you think, want to go? Yeah I, I, yeah, I just have to answer because I need to go. Yeah. So, you know, like, I think you can actually attain racial equality but not seeing the difference from other people right 
be the like we say be the change that you want to see tomorrow so if you want to bring up change it has to start within you and you know like life it's a process and life it's a compromise so you know like uh, if you compromise from the things that you know are very difficult for you to compromise because sometimes like i've been i'm going on a, a program that's being run uh, uh, with virgin island that's going to be uh you sitting with someone that is totally opposite from what you believe people were like saying don't go on that why are you accepting that why i was like I am going there and I don't, I won't mention the person, but they put me with the worst person that is known the whole island. Uh, on <laughs> Ellie, <Yeah. laughs> Ellie, was that eating with the enemy? <laughs> no, 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 I'm on it too. Yes. I'm yeah. on it too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with Virgin Media, eating yeah. with the enemy. You want so, to see my person? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, people were like, Ellie, why are you? I said like, this is what people, you you, exactly. you need, because sometimes these people, it's not like they're bad. Maybe they've encountered an experience that made their mind to be where they are. But by being with you, they can maybe actually change their mind because of how they've, so it's not, this is not wrong. People are like, no, you shouldn't. I'm like, no, the mind of shutting down, that's the worst mind of not finding a way to a solution. But if we are here to find a, a solution, we are going to sleep with our enemies for the sake of the better society that we want to create. So anyway, I want to leave you there and thank you so much, um, Vivert. And please do put in touch. You have my email, you have my yep. Twitter. And yep. you know, like I'm really, really looking forward guys to meet you in person whenever all this madness is over. Definitely, thank you so definitely. much. <laughs> thank you very much, Ali. Cheers, thanks. <laughs> So, I mean, Ali lifted it off there. I mean, I'm on the same program. I was like, God, that's a coincidence eating with the enemy. When you sit down with a completely different person or completely opposite views as, as, as yourself or Virgin Media. Mm -hmm. And um, it is a great way. Again, I go back to sitting down with a cup of tea. It's dialogue. It's fantastic. And I think that's the way forward. It's about just opening up, respecting each other's views. Be proud of who you are. Never, never let society or anyone run you down. Never to feel an ad of who you are or what you believe in and um let's keep going forward that's it <laughs> that's it now that's that's very good that's very thoughtful uh well uh, i just want to close this by saying a few words thank you very much ellie and La uh, lorraine uh for such an insightful discussion and inspiring one you definitely have inspired me personally today i hope to see you guys in our future panels as well in a sense i want to close this panel by saying a few words Racism, as it spells, the change starts with I, and I should be the change for a better society. Likewise, let us all change together for a wonderful cause. And also, thank you very much for the audience, to each and everyone who attended this session. Please do not forget to like, share, and subscribe, and support us. Thank you very much, Lorraine. Thank you. Bye.